Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started here shortly. We're gonna wait for everyone to try to log in to today's training. So give us just a minute here. And for those that are just joining, we will get started here shortly. We have a good sized group for today, so we're just going to wait for everyone to sign into the webinar. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off. So our agenda for today, we're going to have an introduction, training session, webinar instructions, Q&A, and next steps. Today we're going to be covering the project closeout process in Studio Designer. And our, our trainer is consultant partner Marie Lieno. She has worked over a decade in Studio Designer servicing users worldwide. Her firm, Marie Vuitton, is the rebranding of Marie's accounting firm business, focusing on more content and training as the best way to maximize efforts and help businesses, business owners grow. As always during these webinars, please feel free to submit your questions in the control panel box as shown here on the right side of the slide. We'll get to as many questions as we can towards the end of the webinar, the last 15 or so minutes of the webinar training. Hello, Marie, can you hear me okay? I can, gonna, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi, Marie. I am going to switch this over to Marie's screen now and we'll get this started. Okay. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, Basically, hi everybody, my name is Marie. For those of you that um, I do know, thank you for being here. And for those that I haven't had a chance yet to speak to, welcome. Um, I mean, basically this is something that I was really excited to do when I talked with Sarah because uh, project management, we all know that project management is imperative for a successful interior design firm, but you know, what is your process for closing out a project, okay? I chose this as my topic for my first public webinar in over three years because it's something that I continually get asked as a, as a uh, process. And I don't know if we actually really ever had one per se because I think that um, the majority of us kind of work through our projects and, um, kind of close it out. There's not a definite marking of a closeout, right? So um, I try to keep everything as simple as I possibly can. And the first thing, the first slide that you're seeing here is project ma project management. This is what I consider to be the, the timeline of a project, right? I want to make it simple and it's three easy steps. Our, our first phase or phase one is typically the start of a project. This is where a prospective client or a, pros a prospect becomes an actual client. Okay, for me, this is really determined by when we received a signed engagement letter, the retainer, um, if you're doing a call or in-person meeting with the client, this is just the best time for you to go over, you know, everything uh, that happens when you work with us okay i think it's important to walk through the timeline of your project and just you know your processes as a firm and learn about their expectations answer their questions because even though it takes some time in the beginning phases of the projects this is going to help and avoids any unreal expectations for both sides right early on and for retainers i know this is a sticky one some of you collect them some of you don't I myself recommend them. I reach, I recommend them. Okay, you can 
do with that what you want, but this is a direct indication for me and for everybody on the team that this project is really starting, okay? And it's also our only recourse should we, you know, should they decide they don't want to work with us or walk away, we still at least have that because you immediately start investing time and energies into those projects, okay? So um, I, I say collect a retainer. Phase two, right here on project management, this is literally where every everything happens, okay? Everything under the sun. Um, we This is once we've posted the retainer, we set up the client, the room list and all that, and um, everything that goes into managing their project kind of happens here. And that's usually where some of our processes end, right? We're, we're basically orchestrating everything for our install day, okay? But what happens is a lot of us kind of miss the project closeout portion. Um, and, and it's probably one of the most important phases of a project, second only to collecting that uh, prepayment, okay? But that's another topic but because we are not if we're not reviewing and doing this closeout process how then are we able to um, evaluate what did and didn't work right I mean there, there's things that happen in the course of these projects that you know usually we don't anticipate when we're we're starting so the project closeout really entails everything that um, needs to happen what, from from what you're reviewing right down to returning the the retainer or any funds available that remains for the client okay so having covered that so you understand these are the three phases for me that are that are a project okay and if you haven't received uh i, I don't know if these are are uh handouts but i'm going to go to the next screen which brings me to the project closeout and then i'm going to jump right into uh studio okay my project closeout looks something like this again I'm trying to keep it in the three simple steps, right? So we're doing, there's a project review, there's the final invoicing, and then there's the retainer and the commissions portion, okay? Um, and before I jump right into studio, I'm gonna just kind of let you see this for a second. Pulling the project worksheet, for example, this is gonna be one of the first steps, and I'm, I am gonna go ahead and do that for you on, on my project, and hopefully you have this or can screenshot it, but I am gonna, Go ahead and uh, move forward. Okay, so from my studio, and you'll see that I do have three tabs open. Anytime I I'm working in studio, I try to open multiple tabs. It, it avoids mistakes when you're going in and out of the same tab. And when I pull a project worksheet, I'm typically pulling from this section on the left side. And in this case, I, I am going to use a custom report that I made um, for this. And if you need the parameters, I would be happy to give those to you later um, so I can show you. Okay, so this PDF, and I did purposely leave some things so we can go over them during this session. Um, this is the project that you see. I made it really simple. Um, so what we're looking at here, I basically... Uh, let it show proposal order invoice you can kind of see this is everything from the client level okay when you pull when you pull reports from the client my queue is usually adding the word for client anything any reports that we save that say for client let me and my team know that these reports would be they, they can be shared with the client because there's nothing you know internal that we want that we don't want shown on the these kinds of reports okay and what we're looking at here is we're basically looking at the total charge what the clients have paid and what their balances are okay and i know you guys see these you know little freight overpays and stuff like that i usually take this time to clean any of that up i also see a nursery here that probably should have been made inactive because it wasn't a go and they're holding off on this. So what I would like to do at this time typically is I'm gonna make this inactive because I don't wanna see it. What I'm trying to do is evaluate the project as a whole. You can do it from these reports, you can do it from the items tab. I like to look at the report. I usually will kind of save it and that's when I will begin my cleanup of this project, right? So I'm gonna move this aside. If those of you that need to screenshot it so you can follow along, that, 
that would be fine too. Um, I'm gonna move this aside so we can um, begin my little uh, project closed out. So um, in through here, you can see that this, these are all the items that we set up. And at the end of a project, okay, all of the items that you see need to have full accounting. When I when I say full accounting, meaning you can see here, even if it was an invoice, the client has paid us and we have paid our vendor in full and there are no additional changes. So typically if that was one that was an invoice, I would take the time now, like, like for instance, this, these two are now um, ready to be invoiced, even though they're gonna owe a balance due. I usually will probably invoice this on the same invoice, depending on if you're using um, first component. If you are using a first component, that, that's obviously one where you're not showing all, all the different pieces that make something up like a pillow and all of its components, right? So I'm going to uh, go ahead and invoice this out just to kind of get this all going because this is my final step in my project. So when I create the invoice, I will all, I always name them. And for those of you that have a ton of invoicing, you'll know that this is a must. So you don't have to open all the invoices when you're searching for them. But that's really what I'm doing. I'm just kind of cleaning up the project. So now we know that, you know, when they're overpaid, I'll show you what that looks like shortly. So I'm just kind of skimming down to make sure everything's invoiced here. Here's another one that wasn't, so I might just invoice that. Okay. And I will give you a chance to ask questions. Um, and if you look, I also um, wanna mention, I don't ever let things, when I'm making um, the description for the part that the client will see, I typically will never put names um, of you know furniture items that have names or anything that have real names, even down to fabrics. People like to Google things or find them cheaper. I personally just try to make it as basic as I can. And then every all the details are then left on the, the vendor side and we still see them. So the rest of these are in, oh, here's one more that needs to be invoiced, sorry. I'll invoice that and this is the last one. So, um, So that's done. So now this project worksheet, I'm gonna show you what that looks like again. So now it's it's kind of ready to close down. Um, and anything that wasn't approved or like you can see this one wasn't even proposed. I typically will make this inactive or I just know that this project will continue at the end of the year. So you can even just make it an active, anything that I want to know when picking something back up, I will make a note right here in vendor description and or in notes, okay? And then I'm just gonna make this an active. You can make things an active, guys, if you are not um, doing them, like if there's no accounting. Now, if for some reason there was any accounting on that crib, I probably wouldn't have done that. You have to make sure that there's full accounting. So at the end of a project, Everything typically should be invoiced if it if it happened, even returns. Okay, so now that that is done and we do have a time billing, um, if I were to look at that same report one more time, you can now see that everything on that report has been invoiced. Um, you can see the PO if for some reason you needed to look something up, and you can see that I removed the nursery or the the uh, crib. Okay, so this tells me this is almost ready to go. I mean, there are some freights to clean up, and I, I'm going to walk you through that quick process. Okay, so I'm going to put this aside. I move it to my other screen. <laughs> and then um, from the money in tab, you'll see that, you know, they, they've made payments throughout, and they, they do have funds available, which is the retainer and maybe a little bit of freight here and there. So typically what I like to do is I like to clean up first the credits um, and I'm just gonna apply these. So um, I'll just leave that and I'll just say um, apply uh, funds available to the true up. 
Okay, so this is typically what I will do. I take the credits first. When you have some that are offset, like, you know, that they go right in and out, take the credits first, guys, because um, it Studio doesn't let you post a zero, a zero uh, posting. So I always will take the credits first. You want to watch what you have in there so that way you know if you've used it all. And I'll show you what that means. So now you can see we have no more proposal deposits and we do have funds available. And typically the funds available will be, you know, freight true up and the retainer. I know the retainer was 2000. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go ahead and apply all the balances here because before we refund the retainer, I wanna make sure that we've done everything. One of the things that I do also before I actually go in and pay these, I would have gone into, and I'm not, I, I didn't because I knew that I had done it already. I would always go into the time billing and just check one more time that there are no uninvoiced activities. Okay. I always check for that. I also even check with the team to make sure, you know, are there any odds and ends that happen on install day? Are there any, is everybody's time entered as far as time billing? Because I'm about to close out their project. You want to make sure that you try to capture all of this now because what I, I'll see people do is sometimes they'll close out a project, not do this process, kind of, you know, figure out what they need to return if, if applicable and return it. But then later on when, when it's time to review, we will see these little odds and ends or you might see a little vendor deposit, things like that, that will show up when you look at sub ledgers. Okay. Um, so this is what this looks like. I'm going to go ahead and post this to clean this up. And then you'll see now everything on the project is done. I know that there are no more um, outstanding items or anything. And when you go back to the items list, this is literally what everything should look like. Oh, this one needs to refresh. Um, here we go. Give it a second and what I like to see at the end of this is everything that is invoiced now you can see that everything is cleaned up this is what I mean when I say full accounting on an item okay everything is done you can see everything's been invoiced that tells me that there is nothing left in client deposits or vendor deposits and from the money in screen, you can confirm that right here. There, there's nothing. So this is basically the amount that we are to refund to the client at the end of the project. Okay, I see this kind of often missed or sometimes people will say, oh, we're just gonna keep that. We're not returning it because we've over, you know, we're way over on everything or whatever the case may be. You still have to invoice this out. Other, If you left this there, it would remain as a client deposit indefinitely. Okay, so um, that is probably one of the most important things, primarily because anything that you forget to invoice, and I have seen it happen, is going to uh, be either a client deposit or a vendor deposit. Okay, and I, I say I'm going to uh, make a statement right now. This statement I repeat many times per day, and if for those of you that work with me know that I say this constantly. Studio will not recognize income or expense until you invoice the client, even if the invoice is zero. Okay, and that's usually what ends up happening when I when I see the things like that where people forget to invoice. What happens is there might be one or two or a lot of items that forget to get, get invoice. The client will pay a hundred percent on proposal. And we will pay our vendor 100% when we place the order. And then I don't know what happens sometimes, and then it just gets left there. Well, they said, what do you mean I have to invoice the client? The, they paid in full, they don't owe us, there were no freight differences. We paid the vendor in full, there were no nothing changed. What do you mean I have to invo invoice for what? Well, if you don't invoice them, the monies that the client paid remain in client deposits. So if you ran a client deposit report, you would see like this old client show up on that report. This vendor deposit, that would be a vendor deposit and it would live there until that's invoiced. And the last reason why you want to invoice is in the event that there is sales tax that's due, 
the, basically the amount in client deposits gets transferred over to your sales income and the amount that's here in vendor deposits gets transferred to cost of sales. You don't see that happen, but that's what's happening behind the scenes here, okay? And any amounts that are attributable to sales tax then move over to sales tax. So if you didn't do that, those would live on the balance sheet, meaning you wouldn't have claimed that for the tax year, okay? It wouldn't have gone to cost of sales um, or sales income. So the income wouldn't have been counted and neither would the sales tax. So this is why it's so important. And then typically at this stage, I will go in once more and I will run run this. I save it in the file just to make sure that at least, you know, at the time that I ran the reports, guys, like I try to keep a close out like folder for all the reports and everything at the end of the project. That's when I re refund the retainer. That way, if we ever needed to visit this project going forward, either to work with this client or another client that was similar, we would be able to just open that one file with all the final profitability, er everything that happened, and then you can pull from it. But the main reason why I encourage everybody to have this process is one, it ensures you don't miss anything, but two, and this is the most important thing for me, this is the way that you're going to make changes to how you do business. And let me show you what that profitability report looks like. Oops, I'll go over here. And I'm gonna pull this profit report right here and I'm going to um, just pull it up. And that way, when I pull this profitability report, which I do save in my project closeout file, I can see all the items. I can see what we purchased them for. Now, this is obviously not an, a client shared report. This is an internal one that I keep. So you can see the purchase costs. You can see what we sold it for. Okay, I'm not, we didn't break down, you know, other costs, sales tax and all that. This is basic purchase, selling. This is what we made per item, what we made on the extras, whether freight, install and that kind of thing so this is the total uh profitability and you can see that you know for the time billing we lost um but primarily what you want to look at is this section this section right here the the percentages if you know that your standard markup is whatever that is to you right let's just say it's 40 percent everything here should be roughly about that and anything that is below that like maybe this 35 percent here I want to look at why it's less than what I had imagined it to be okay this this particular you know review this is how we make changes this is how we also you know if we're not making much either you know I, I want to look at it is it because of the because of our vendor is it because of an internal mistake basically we want to review this because this is how we're going to make adjustments so we can improve our profitability the next go around if you are not having these conversations then hopefully you're just operating and making a really good profit and you know that maybe there's nothing to adjust and then that's great but typically what i will see here is when i go to look at this with somebody typically you know um the designers or the owners of the firm we're wanting to this kind of make the changes here and sometimes it, it could be either well maybe we should mark up more when we use so and so whatever the case may be you can have a standard markup all across the board company wide and then make it special when you have certain vendors you know maybe your fabricator you may want to mark up more because you know you have a good relationship and and cost it's cost effective those are things that you can um, kind of tweak and adjust going forward so that way you could do better otherwise if you're not reviewing this we're kind of just going okay well that we did great on that project like on to the next right that's not where the magic happens how you increase your profitability is by actually you know understanding what happened what didn't work and making those changes okay and i i think that's kind of what people don't always see. And for me, um, I don't like to uh, give out commissions or, or, you know, pay out staff or anybody. I typically will always wait to the end of the project if you ever give, you know, referrals or things like that because everything looks good in the beginning when we're in the planning stages. But 
you know, as what you guys know as well as I do, that, you know, just things happen along the project to make things kind of just change. This is the review of ma making sure that, you know, we're just operating to the best of our capabilities. So um, this is what I do. And I just save that. I save that, then we refund the retainer and, and keep it going. So um, I do have report parameters for everything that you saw here. Um, I probably should have made that a handout, but um, I would be uh, getting close to being able to answer any questions you have based on the things that I've said. Um, Sarah, is there anything else that I'm I'm missing in as far as this co coverage? No, that's that's great, Marie. I, um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just did a walk over refunding the retainer, but that that's this is where we're left off. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, for those of you that um, I, that have registered, I, I, I would be able to also give you the report parameters. I, I thought I did that, but I don't see it anywhere. Um, so I have those if, if in the event that you wanted to get a copy of the report, because the report that I created was a, a personalized report. But once you have the parameters, you can just set those up in your own respective studios. You can literally make any other report if you don't like these you know hopefully all of you know how to use the report writer so you can make any type of report but I typically will start with one of the legacy reports and then I I tweak it based on what I want to see and usually we do this for all the owners as well you know they don't want to come in here and and play within the system I usually will just set up one or two basic reports for them and then they know just to always walk in on Monday or whenever they do it and, and look at those reports. It's also good to kind of have these for the team, you know, as a, at a quick glance so they know. It kind of just forces everybody to stay on budget. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, Marie, that um, a lot of questions have come in um, through good. the question box and they do, a lot of the users do want those parameters. So okay. Um, I will go ahead and send a follow-up email after today's training to provide you all with those parameters. So we'll, awesome. we, will, um, we will get that information to everyone that's on the call specifically today. And also as a reminder, this training webinar will be recorded. Awesome. Okay. And I'd like to get a copy. And um, I'm happy. I, I, I don't know if I'm a little bit faster on timing, but, but I'm happy to, you know, do do as many questions as we possibly can. And I will leave my screen up just so we can kind of, um, I can show if it went applicable to some of these questions, I can kind of show you within the system. But um, yeah, I'm happy okay. to start taking and knocking out as many as I can. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. So we have a question that's come in from Debbie. What is okay. GPM on the project? Looks like she found it on the project worksheet profit. It's right here. That's the gross profit margin. And um, so that's basically what you're making. And I, I will show you what that is. So let's just take this foyer accent wall, for example. Okay, here um, it's, let's see, where's the gross profit margin here? Hold on. Oh, wait a minute, wrong one. You can pull that, and for those of you that don't know, you can actually pull different details here. Let's see. Oh, don't know if that's going to be. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So when you look, and for those of you, hopefully you are using these, you can use these filters or these views. Um, I love that Studio, you know, in the back in the day, people used to print monstrous spreadsheets over and over, make the changes, then redistribute them again. Well, here, Studio lets you pull different things. Almost everything that you can do within Studio doesn't require you to print things. I, I usually only tell accounting people, for those of you that have bookkeepers or admin, I usually only teach them to kind of save all these erroneous reports, but the majority of when I work, I look in here. So that profitability that you were looking at, and I'm trying to see if I have it on my, I don't have that profitability, but it does fall in line with this. And so I'm not sure why it 
reads it's at a hundred percent profit. So um, let's see. every single one is at a hundred percent gross profit margin. I'm gonna have to look at that because that doesn't always happen. And I don't know if it's because of how I set this up or not. But is that's one that I would like to get back. But it does stand for gross profit margin. And all of them, I don't think, should be at 100%. But Sarah, if you can put that one down, I'm going to look into that. I, I did notice that right now. And that yeah, is absolutely. a weird total. But I, I will look into it. But it usually doesn't always read. The, those kind of all range in, in profitability percentages. So I will have to look at that. But that was a good question. And for those mm -hmm. of you that like to stump me I welcome those so that's why I kind of let it be an open question session so yeah by all means um, whoever sent that one and for those of you that are in attendance I am going to look into that um, when we get off session and you'll get an answer for that okay great um, another question comes in why would you, why would you put um, time billing uh, for that to be a minus that comes in from Maria Okay, why would, reason, why would time billing be a minus? Okay, the reason why it's coming in differently is because I did create a time billing and the client rate for what we were billing is, it's less than my rate. I, I use this for a lot of training purposes and my personal rate is, is higher than what we're billing the client. So that's why it, it's negative. So it, technically it, it costs more to pay me my rate than what we built the client for 1650. That's why my, my rate is in there. It, okay. It's in there under my own personal rate. All right. So that's why it isn't a negative. So for like, like if you're setting up the rates, which you should be for, for all of your uh, team, it, it will take into account what you would pay them for that time. So if you have like a junior or an assistant uh, designer and maybe you're uh, you're having them enter their time, you know, in activities and then you bill the client, you will you should see a profit. Maybe not so much when you're billing your own time, you know, to your like for yourself or your designer time billing. You know, like if you're billing like one hundred fifty dollars an hour and you're billing the client at one hundred fifty dollars an hour, then it, kind, it, it washes. It's not going to it's not going to really be a profit. But if you're if you have a, a, a somebody on your team or staff and their rate is a little less, you should see that as a profit. Okay, you great. Probably be billing, you know, the, your client uh, more than what you're paying them, and you take a little cut. All right, Marie. Another uh, profit question has come in. It looks like from David. Uh -huh. David says, so the profit only reflects the sale cost minus the purchase cost. How do you calculate an admin expense and labor time billing? Well, those are usually captured in activities and under time. So like, um, let me show you. When you're doing activities and you're entering time, let's just say here, so like when you're entering these different activities and there's a lot of different ones because I don't just I don't only do I'm I actually don't do any interior design but so the rates are going to be listed a little differently here but whatever rates that you put in it's going you can put in everything for your team but as you can see here see how it's going to calculate an employee rate that's because I set this system up so I'm I'm running some tests on it so I set it up to be like that. So if some, if you're billing for somebody's rate, at, like all across the board, all the clients are, I set up to do 150. So if you're billing somebody and their time, their rate that you're paying them is more or less, that that's going to be reflected in the profitability. Okay. And this is also the case when you do those money out things. And and I don't know if that's a whole other webinar topic but money out postings for overhead things like um i'm trying to think what a good example is so if you take your client out to a meeting like you guys go out for coffee for for in, for example and um you know we're not going to probably bill your client for that cup of coffee however um for me and and the clients that i work with if if i know that she took the client out 
I happen to just know that that client is client Jones. So I may just put it and I'll just, I'll, I'll show you um, here. I'm, I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. So if we were gonna do, and I'm just gonna do restaurants. Um, so I'm just gonna pretend that this was a normal thing, right? If I'm taking my client to a restaurant and um, I don't wanna bill them for it, but I do want the job cost to be it, I, I can put the client here. And what this does is this is gonna um, make that, I'll show you, um, I'm gonna just say Starbucks, okay. I'm just gonna show you. So right now, if I put this to meals and entertainment and we went to Starbucks for 25 bucks, I can do that. And I will show you what it looks like on that report because I am gonna post this. If I wanted to bill them, like maybe if it was postage and I wanted to bill them, you have the ability to bill them here. What this entry will do, for those of you that don't know, is it's gonna create an activity and that it would be part of your uh, time billing. Okay, if you're not gonna, uh, post it to a reimbursable, I would just post it here and I'll, I'll show you what this looks like, okay? I'm gonna save and close that. Okay, so now, oh, let me post it. Okay, now watch what happens when I pull that report now. Okay. So this is that same report, you guys. But see now it has a 25 office expense. Like I'm not billing the client for it, but anytime that I spend anything for a client, whether it's samples that maybe I'm gonna keep forever in the office, whatever it is that you want charged to that job, put that client in that money out entry when you do that and it will account for it. And me personally, I like to know those things. Um, even if we are doing like mileage reimbursement because, um, I don't know, the admin had to go drop off samples instead of us mailing it for whatever reason that was, I would want to capture it. I, I probably would bill the client back for something like that. But again, I, I mean, I, I just like to know. So any little things that I can um, attribute to the client, I want to know that because I want to deduct that from the profitability. Does that make sense? Um, that's, yeah, that's great, Marie. We, we have another question that's okay. come in actually regarding reports Okay. while we're on that topic. So this yeah. comes from Lawrence. Can you review the reports to run on the vendor side to be sure it's all closed out? Yes, and I should have saved it. This particular one I didn't save, but um, I can. Let's see. Um, it, is he referring to vendor deposits? Just to be clear. Um, maybe if you could maybe clarify it, that, Lawrence. It, yeah, Lawrence, if you can clarify that. I'm gonna I am gonna look at this. So um this is a poor example right now because I don't have any vendor deposits. I made that project specific to my training and I tried to make everything inactive so things wouldn't pop up. However, yes, you can do that. I usually do. The problem with clicking show details when you're running a vendor deposit report though, is that um, it will show the in and out of the PO. So I know that gets a little confusing. Um, I am happy to give the report parameters for the one that I run. I just have to pull it. I can't do it on this one because this doesn't have it. But Sarah, if you can <laughs> take that note down. I'm. These are really easy and I'm happy to just make one sheet that answers a lot of these questions offline and then I'll give it to Sarah to just distribute to all of you. I'm, I'm happy yep, to do that. Making a note here. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay great. Um, so another question comes, yeah, another question comes in from Christine. How do you refund the retainer in Studio Designer? Um, oh, that's a good one, that's easy. So right now, I have two options. Um, I usually will tell everybody to run this uh, check from um, Studio. Some of you guys have your own checkbook and you just handwrite it. Um, if you were handwriting a check, and I will always tell the designer, make sure we've done this, and then let me give you the dollar amount. And then, so if, if the designer was handwriting a check and they just happened to be there, I would say, okay, write the check and, and tell me what check number it is and how I would do that would 
would be in through here. And instead of receiving a client payment, what I would be doing here was putting it in the, you know, the checking account. But instead here, I'll do like check. And then you'll give me the, the designer would tell me the check number that they wrote. And then I would just go in here and make it um, 398.32. And I would say um, refund a client retainer and funds available balance. So I might do something like that and add the check number. If she doesn't have a handwritten checkbook and I need to print it from the system, I would not post this. I would change the checking account to be suspense. Okay, I use suspense a lot and I train everybody I work with to use suspense. So what would happen is this would post to suspense and it would clear this. I'm actually gonna do it so I can show it to you. Okay, so um, I'm gonna not do it. I'm gonna do it into suspense. Okay, so that answers the question for if you were gonna handwrite it, but I'm gonna do it like this. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to post this as the uh, refund. Okay, so I'm going to say this. Okay, so now it's zero. But then what you'd have to do is to go to money out. And I'm going to do the office payment. And I'm going to go in here and print. Okay, so I would do something like that and then I would post it to suspense and then I would, ooh, does anybody remember the dollar amount? I don't remember. Do you remember, Sarah, what the dollar amount was? I'm so sorry, I don't. I don't either. Hang on, I'll go look for it. Oh, 398.32, okay. Um, I'm gonna, normally I would print it, but I'm not. I'll just put the manual check um, and I will just say it, um, check 203. So this right here, what we're doing is refunding the client that money. And I'm gonna just show you the last and final step that I do to know that I didn't miss anything is I go in here to um, my suspense account and now you can see that these two clear. So these two, I, I would just reconcile it and that means that the client got their refund um, and that their money in is clean as well. So that is the end of that, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you were to look at the project one more time, um, just to see those reports one more time. Okay, now um, you can see from here, just one more time, um, that their, uh, all their project stuff right here, this 2260168 is in fact what the uh, project cost, 2260168. So what I would then do at that point is I would go in here and just make all the items inactive and then if the client, you know, if we work with them again for that nursery later, you know, then we'll pick back up. But you can also see here, if you're filtering, you can see the profitability and stuff like that on the very top, okay? Um, if, you're, if you're setting up these items, the main things that I wanna point out is use item numbers. I personally use custom room lists for every project. It, it, it is better, it's it's a good practice. Um, and that's really it, I'm big on the components and, and, and using that um, and doing everything from within studio. I talk to my clients very little. Like we don't, we all have a really good system of how we, we interact and use studio within each other. You don't have to know everything, but if you all know your respective pieces, it, it really works out even for accounting, so. Um, any more questions? I, I think we have time for a few more. Yep, absolutely. So we have a question from Michelle. Mm -hmm. What if you do not have funds available left and there are little outstanding amounts? Okay, I would try to eat up any 
over unders right for freight but when you have whatever little balance would still be available that means we've used up everything i then um send it to the client still through studio and i say hey you know we've closed out the project i i make sure that i let them know the one thing um that i want to make sure that you know is i if i'm going to use the retainer depending on if the client you know is is gonna freak out or not and you guys know who who those people are um i would prob i may document and send them something before i start to eat into their retainer and then i make sh sure to document that and then i send it all to them so then it's very clear and if they want to talk about it i just have them call me but typically there's no misunderstanding i'm big on communicating along the way and not just dealing with them everything that comes up because it eliminates problems like down the road especially when it's time to do the uh, retainer because they're like why i thought i get this at the end well you do if we don't have any balances due then we eat that up and refund whatever if we can't refund it then that means they they do owe us and it's a lot easier to collect at that point when the project ends versus oh we found this um six months later All right. <laughs> so an, another question has come in from Linda. Mm -hmm. When you are going through items and converting to invoices, it seems you created several individual invoices. Yes. Wouldn't the client be inundated by so many? Also, can you create an invoice that combines time billing and items into one? Okay, good question. Um, I don't send the client every little invoice uh, unless they wish to see it because the ones that are zeroed out, like they, the word invoice freaks people out. Okay. So I try not to, I not to, try not to over send things. The, the reason why sometimes I might do that is because when they're certain they paid certain amounts, you know, I just want to make sure that things are clear, but, um, uh, yeah, I I do just I I'm good about just sending them the about sending them the update sending them the balance and I mean I don't usually I don't yeah I, I don't send every single invoice if it's zero the invoice is more for internal if they later on ask for it for whatever reason you know then I can give it to them but otherwise I think it, yeah it is redundant and it's sending them a lot if i need to i'm happy to just send a, a project worksheet and then that outlines everything if they wanted a copy i mean you can send it but you can usually tell them well for the zero ones i don't want to like flood your email so that's usually how i handle it and i'm i i send statements out every so often and if they wanted to see the project i would send them the project worksheet just so they know Okay, thanks, Marie. Mm -hmm. Another question has come in also regarding invoicing. Mm -hmm. There are many delays that prohibit a full install for the whole project. Understood. Do you have a recommendation or process for progress invoicing, meaning it is not the final invoice, but a partial invoice? Well, okay, good question. Um, what I like to do is I will always for me, I like everybody to ask for 100%. I know some people cringe at me saying that, like, how do you really say that? Well, um, I'm going to tell you this, when you don't ask for 100%, guys, and we potentially, you know, sometimes have to pay the vendor 50 or often 100% to even start, you're, you're basically funding their, their, uh, project for them and that's something that i really have a hard time hard time doing so everybody that i work with i i just make sure we're asking for 100 percent. so there isn't a ton of cleanup on my projects at the very end and then i i do try to clean up the odds and ends like like what we saw if one project had you know we overpaid they overpaid on the freight and one project maybe they didn't i really try to clean those up so that way when i do send them an invoice i'm only sending them one and not one that oh you overpaid here and here you underpaid and like that's too much i try to eat them all up within reason and then i send them the one that they owe but i explain and say just so you know this was just the overage and usually it's a lot lower anyways because we've cleaned up 
all the other items. So then whatever little balance that they owe, I try to send it on one or two things. Um, and as far as invoicing, I don't know if that was part of the question about invoicing the items. I love to invoice them with the labels because when you're looking, when you have a ton of invoices for projects um, on, in the invoice tab, it's, it just makes for easier searching. So all of mine are listed like that. Um, I might have a lot of items on a proposal, but just remember, you do not have to invoice on the same as the proposal or anything. And then the other answer to that question, because of the time billing and the items, time billing is invoiced differently than items. But when you do invoice the time billing through activities, it will automatically create like a time billing room for the client. So you will be able to see these little like entries for those like down here um, in the time billing room. This is something I didn't create. It, this is the entry that goes into Studio, like it's on the back end when I do a time billing. And here's where you can see, like my rate just happened to be more than what I was billing this client. And that's only because I was doing it for this training. So that's why we saw that profitability be, you know, be negative. Okay. Does that okay. answer that? Okay. Great, thank you, Marie. Mm -hmm. um, a few users have chatted in regarding setting items to inactive at the end of the process. So Candace yes. writes in, you mentioned after invoice, you would set those items to inactive. So I think the, the question is, um, to that being said, is that going to affect your end reports, which Debbie is asking? Good job. No, no, they will not um, affect reports. Um, the reason why I like making things inactive, guys, is because one, I, I work, I, a lot of the people I deal with have been with me for a decade or more, um, and I, I actually meet a lot of interior designers that have been in business for a long time, and navigating through those systems that have just a ton of stuff open is just, it's slow, it's cumbersome, you're scrolling a lot, and um, it just I think it's just neater because I always am it when I look through people's system I'm always looking to make sure there's full accounting but I just think it's a clean way to for it to happen if you ever need access to anything old you could even run reports or even views from up here and still filter for inactive items so I do do that in some cases um you know, and or cloning if you want to use like a like I know I used a rug on client Jones and now I want to maybe use that same one or propose it. I I would just go in and clone it, but then I still go back and check with the vendor for that RFQ. Like did their pricing change? Because we all know across the board in our industry, things are just changing. So that goes for even setting up items in inventory. If you know that you always use like Perigold for a certain item. If you then find another vendor that has that item, don't know why, but it's cheaper or, or discontinued or something, you can still buy those things through other vendors. But what will happen in inventory is you'll have a really good history of who you paid and how much, and you'll get to see the fluctuation in the history tab of an inventory item, for those of you that don't know. So yeah, that why I do that. I make everything inactive. It's just a cleaner working space for everybody. You don't have to. I just know that I've seen when people don't and it's just a lot to look at. It's my own personal preference. You can leave them open if you want to. Okay, great. So a couple mm -hmm. more questions yeah. uh, for today's time. So from a previous question, follow-up questions are coming in from Chrissy and Kelly. They want clarification if we can combine items and time billing entries on one invoice. You can combine time billing entries. Time billing entries are all together and items are all together. You can't um, combine them. If you wanted, for whatever reason, and I have seen people want to do it, if you wanted something that would be billed in time billing, but you wanted it to, to be on an invoice with items, I would set up another, I, I, you could set up an item or a room list for like those 
odds and ends and extras and just set it up and, and then include it in that. Just I'm really just adamant about documenting everything across the board from the item setup. But yeah, you could do it that way. That's a workaround. Okay, great. Um, and then another question comes in from Justine about making items inactive. She's asking, is it better to set the client inactive instead of going through each item to set that inactive? If you make the client inactive, that won't make their items inactive. Um, but I usually sometimes will make the client inactive as well. Um, I like it that way because um, if I use them again, I might set them up and I know people say, well, you can use projects, you can use this. I will just be honest. I don't know if Sarah's gonna like me to say this. <laughs> In the beginning, I tell everybody across the board set up only clients and set up only vendors don't go in i know studio gives you a ton of options i'll explain why in other sessions but the reason for that being is because you don't until you're fully using studio and it's working for your business every which way you want it to the best thing is somebody's either a client or a vendor if they're not manu they're not anything else just leave it at those two for now and then as you want to expand and include manufacturing all those other classifications but it's best to just do it that way and between you and i i would set up a client so if that this client wants to use that crib later on and maybe we don't do this uh, project for another year or whatever the case may be i might change this client to say um latsis uh 2022 or latsis Foyer, and then I would set up another client that says, you know, Latsis 2023 or Latsis Nursery. The reason for that is because when you continue to use the same one over and over, sometimes some of your original setups have kind of changed as we've evolved as a company or or with working with this client. But also for the sake of pulling uh, financial reports, I don't want to have to back out the amounts that came from this first project when looking at things. So I try to just, I like it new every time and it, it just helps for organizing. And you don't have to do it that way. I just have a lot of old tips and tricks that I've been using and typically see what works. I get the leg up you guys, because I see the troubleshoot calls. I take a lot of those calls. So even if you don't work with me, when something comes up out of the nor normal or something gets messed up, I take a lot of those calls. Those, those are the ones that I usually like to do and then I walk you through it or give you a process for it so you have it going forward. Okay, and our last question for today, Marie, in, in um, to your point, mm -hmm. uh, troubleshooting calls and seeing different people's accounts. In your experience from Gwyneth, she's asking, what is a good target GPM? Ooh, I get this a lot. And some of the times I would never put it in writing, you guys, but I probably shouldn't even say it in person, but I will. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I will say across board, again, it, it varies by state and by country because I do do international. Um, but if I had to just say, pick something, tell me something, I would say 42. With, right. higher, with higher, with <laughs> higher for fabricators, a lot higher. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining, and thank you, Marie. I'm going to switch the slide to our contact information. The last slide here for today's webinar, and I also, as promised, for everyone that attended today, I will email you Marie's um, two custom reports. I believe it was right. Yeah, yeah. two custom.